Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you believe that there is more to life than what you see right now and you want to find out more, listen in as her guests share their journey and their extraordinary experiences. Now, here is your host, Rhonda Grant. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show. Sometimes the universe has a way of placing people or obstacles in your path to help guide and direct you on your mission. Listen in as we discover the path my guest has traveled. Has he been inspired by a calling, crafted his journey, or a bit of both? I invite you to embrace the conversation and to use it to help you to recognize if this is happening in your life. Our guest today is Wendell and Miss Max Stalker, musician, artist, and now published author. Wendell was born above the Arctic Circle and raised in Kotzebue, Alaska by his father, Jacob Stalker Sr., and mom, Maria T. Stalker. He had three sisters and six brothers. He moved from Norichuk, Alaska, where he lived for the first six years of his life, to Kotzebue. At Norichuk, people spoke the Inopiak Eskimo language. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show, Wendell. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, I'm so excited about our conversation because I have read some of your book and I'm really interested in a lot of things that you write about. But I'd like you to tell the audience first a little bit about your early beginnings. Well, in the beginning, uh, I started writing a lot of people in upstate New York where we lived for seven years. Yes. Didn't know about the lifestyle of the Eskimo natives above the Arctic Circle. Mm. They thought it was a different country. Oh, yes. So so I had the right to let them understand that we we may live way above the Arctic Circle, but we're still Americans. Mm -hmm. And I write in the style of my grandparents because that style is being forgotten. There are not too many that could still remember the old stories. Yes. And I was lucky to live the first six years of my life speaking and and just living the Eskimo lifestyle. How was the stories important that you learned while you were growing up? Well, when I was growing up, I was able to sit with the elders and listen to the Eskimo stories in the Inupiaq Eskimo language. Yes. And as I grew older, I noticed a lot of people that I grew up with didn't understand our language. Yes. So I decided I should write down what I know and write it in the style of my grandparents so that some of the stuff that I personally know wouldn't get lost. So valuable. Well, and that you knew that that was important to preserve that. Yeah, it's very important because there is so much knowledge that the elders passed on that is being lost. And the stories that I write, were told to me by grandparents and by elders who all knew the stories. Though I write in fiction, they are based on what the elders taught me from the old stories. Yes. Well, that is uh, incredible. And so some of these uh, stories would have been actual teachings on how to survive in the harsh climate. Yes. Alaska is huge with, yes. with mountains from one end of the state to the other and rivers crisscrossing uh-huh. the state. And above the Arctic Circle, we get a lot of cold weather. And so we had to use the knowledge of the elders 
to survive the cold weather by working together, hunting and fishing, and learn how to utilize all the resources, mm-hmm. whether it be resources like the forest or resources from the ocean and rivers and lakes. Yes. It was taught how we could get the animals by the elders. Yes. The elders knew the animals. The elders knew the terrain. Mm-hmm. They had names for all the hills and bends in the rivers and the stands of trees. There was names for every place, and those names are being forgotten. But as I write down these things, I realize that I didn't forget because the elders taught me in such a way that I was able to remember. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, as elders tell a story, there would be a dozen elders, and each of the elders knew the story by heart. So they taught me that way of telling a story by using either a carving or a picture or 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 just a line on, drawn on the sand. Yes. They trigger memories that my grandparents put in my head so that those memories would come back alive as I sit and contemplate on how my grandparents would tell the story. Yes. Many of the older stories were told by my grandparents, and I just changed the names and modernized everything so that people could understand in the English language. Mm -hmm. The Eskimo alphabet is a lot different, and because there are some letters there that are not in the English language, so my wife would help me write down the words using the keyboard. Because the Eskimo language have pronunciations that sound like you're trying to cough something up. And oh, okay. those, those, those letters there are, that are not in the English language had to be rewritten in such a way that I could understand in my Eskimo language and my wife could understand in the English language. Right. So we we sat together and found ways to write the words to make them sound as familiar as possible as uh, Eskimo alphabet. Mm-hmm. The, the knowledge that the elders gave to me It's not just me, but everyone who listened to the stories at the time. Though I was just five or six years old, those stories stayed with me because I lived the country, I ate the animals, and I lived the weather. So those things all trigger memories of the stories that I write down. So it is easier for me to write down because... It is like my grandparents talking through my pencil. Yes. I use I use a pencil and, and a notepad to write everything down. And as I write down one sentence, that one sentence will trigger memories to write the next sentence. Mm-hmm. So it's Eskimo way of remembering that I write down. And I write it in such a way that anybody could understand and could relate. As the people in upstate New York listening, listen to me read my short stories, after the story is done, the people that have never been to Alaska would thank me and say, it feels like you have just taken my hand and walked me through northern part of Alaska. Mm. I write it in such a way that my grandparents would understand, and I write it in a way that English people could understand. So I make sure that none of the meanings is lost in translation. So right. what what I write down in English could also be written down in Eskimo language, and a lot of the elders could recognize where the story came from. Mm-hmm. As, as I write a, a short story, there might be maybe 15 or 20 pages, but out of the 15 or 20 pages, there might be a half a dozen of the old stories put together to make one story. I see. So it is just writing 
from Inupiaq to English. Mm-hmm. So when you would go on a hunt or go fishing in order to bring uh, food in either to the village or to your home for your children, or when your mom and dad would do that, were there certain places where people knew ahead of time where animals might be? I mean, I know it was the rhythm of the ocean and certain fish would be in certain places at different times of the year. But yes. did did the Eskimo people, did they rely on a sort a sixth sense in order to know where the animals would be that day if they needed food? Yes. Uh, there was people that knew the habits of the animals, the yes. migration routes and the food they eat. So uh, if you know where uh, the caribou's food is, the lichen that they eat, the moss that they eat, you you are more likely to get a caribou because the caribou are there to eat that food. Mm-hmm. So the elders would tell us each animal had a different diet and each each plant that the animal ate grew at a certain place. Most right. most plants did not grow on the northwest side of, of the hill or mountain because up above the Arctic Circle, we get a northwest wind. Right. And that tends to kill all the animals in the fall time, and and it blows all winter. So mm-hmm. we learn to hunt for food on the southwest sides of the mountains and hills and follow the rivers and creeks and lakes. So the elders knew that, and they taught us at an early age, in order for us to survive, we had to know where the animals went to eat or to mate or just... Uh, their migratory routes, Mm -hmm. because that is very important. And also, another thing that our elders taught us, that there were people called shamans who were able to communicate with their spirit helpers. And their spirit helpers would inform the shaman where the animals were. So if the older people from long ago were starving, they would give a gift to the shaman and ask for information where the animals were. Mm-hmm. And then they would go out and most, most times the information from the shaman never failed. Right. So if a community is starving, a shaman is very important because that shaman was the only one who was able to communicate with the spirit helper. Mm-hmm. So the Eskimo people from long ago knew that a shaman was very important because of the survival of the community depended on the knowledge of the shaman spirit helper. Oh, yes. So even though sometimes the shaman did very bad things, he was also very important in keeping the whole community alive. So we tolerated the shamans, but we also knew from from way back, I think it was the 30s, 1930s, when we had our, our shaman named Manila, that mm-hmm. our operation was named after up there in Kotzebue. He told the native people about the Holy Spirit, yes. about the Creator, and about a lot of things that were to come later, about the airplanes, about the telephone, about the computers, and, and the people of long ago didn't believe him. Mm-hmm. So he had to move away from society and... We, as people, remember those teachings by Manila and knew that there was a creator that was more powerful than any of the powers that the shamans had. Mm -hmm. So we were able to accept the first missionaries later when they came because Manila had prepared us for who we call Atanak, who is the creator of everything. Mm. So we have knowledge from the spirits, spirit helpers that taught us that there will be religion coming and there would be all the modern enmities that we enjoy today. Mm-hmm. And this, this was told way back like 100 years ago. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds like uh, what they were talking about uh, was so foreign because it almost, I mean, even when I think of my grandmother and she said to me, we used to sit on her front porch and she said to me, I have seen more in my life that you will ever see in your life because she was born um, in the very early 1900s. And she saw the television, the telephone, and they thought it, she thought it was just incredible that she was able to pick up the phone and call someone and watch something on television. But since then, um, our since she's passed, I mean, our technology has zoomed it. I mean, my grandma would think that my my telephone was magic. My cell phone was magic. Yes. That I was, I would be able to do the types of things on my phone. I mean, she just wouldn't be able to believe that. And so it is really hard uh, when these messengers uh, in the early 1900s and even lo- all the way along would uh, predict the future for people not to believe and even get angry with those people and think that they. Um, are making it up and you know what I mean? So was there any of that, that people didn't believe what the shaman was saying? Yes, yes, uh, the the prophet are talking about Manilak. Uh Uh-huh. He wasn't believed and they thought that he was lying. Mm -hmm. So he left those people and he go live by himself somewhere. Right. So he, he had to move away from people because they all called him liar. Because yes. they couldn't understand the concept of people talking to another person on the other side of the world. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yes. Also, airplanes. He predicted the coming of the airplanes, the jets. And back, back then, well, actually, I'm sorry, I made a mistake on the date. I think it was uh, 18, 1830s, I think. Yes, when eight, he, yes. When he, when Manila came and talked to the people. Mm-hmm. Earlier, I said 1930s, it was 1830s. Yes, I made yeah, a mistake but, on the, yeah, by, no, uh, by okay. 100 years, I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the people couldn't believe and they laughed at him. So he had to leave society, the people that he knew, the people he grew up with. So there, there are things in the in your past Eskimo thinking mm-hmm. where we have to see something to believe it's true mm-hmm. until the shaman could show that what what he says is really going to happen. Mm-hmm. So if the shaman can't produce evidence that what he says is going to really happen, they will quit listening to him and quit going to him and mm-hmm. find another shaman who had a good good way of uh, presenting the uh presenting a solution to any problem that the people come to him with. And okay. most times it's most times it's hunger. Who okay. you know, where do I get food? Right. The Eskimo style of remembering sometimes to me it's very simple because mm-hmm. I was trained at it. Uh, by remembering either looking at a picture and remembering part of a story from the picture. Yes. Like I have my parents and grandparents right by my shoulder when I'm writing. So my parents and grandparents are dressed in their traditional Inupiaq clothing Mm -hmm. from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet to stay warm. And I just have to look at the picture and a thousand words will come to me. Uh-huh. So I would just have to put the right words down in English to coincide with the thoughts that need to come out in the book. 
Mm. So once I make a plan on what subject to write on, the rest is easy because it's just like having an encyclopedia set. I just have to look at my grandparents and parents' pictures and the pit and the story will come to my mind as to how my grandparents told it. Is it they, almost like that their spirit is visiting you during that time? Yes. It's uh-huh. it's like it's like they are using my hand and guiding the pencil to write the words down. Wow. So I also get bad case of uh, just thinking back to my grandparents' time when I was young mm-hmm. and then looking up and seeing my 58-inch color TV yes. <laughs> and actually get culture shock. I oh. get a headache. I get oh. a very bad headache because I'm changing from my grandparents' language of the Inupakishimu language. Remember where there was no metal or very little metal and then opening my eyes to the world of today of the of my 58 inch smart tv in front of me just freaks my eskimo mind out i have to take a nap to stop the headache Right, because it's almost as if your spirit has merged with your ancestors and it's and then when you come out of that and you look at the television, it gives you a headache. Yeah, I, yeah and, and I'm a writer myself and I do understand what you're what you're speaking about for sure. I had not thought of being in the spirit of someone, an ancestor, although I think about my grandma often because she had special abilities where she knew things ahead of time. She would dream things ahead of time. But I have a space, um, I had a near-death experience where I now have the ability to tap into a place that feels unique to me and I'm able to write from that space. I'm able to speak from that space, write from that space, and reside in that space. And I think we may still be talking about the same thing. Is that correct? I mean, that's where my creativity, that's where I go for my direction, for the words that I need to use. And it's hard for me to take credit for some of the things that I write because I really feel that I've been assisted. Yes. Is that, yeah. I know, I know the feeling. Uh huh. I know the feeling. It's just like my grandparents grabbing a hold and taking care of, taking control of my hand and fingers, uh-huh. and I watch the words written down on paper. Mm-hmm. And then after I re- read it over, I will say, thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Grandpa. Yes. Because those words that come down on paper are part of my grandparents' teaching of remembering. Right. So when I start remembering how they said stuff, how they did things, Mm-hmm. and why they said stuff and why they did things, then it all comes down to a narrow lane where this word does not belong, but that word does. Right. So instead of using a synonym, I would have to draw a complete picture using several pages to let the spirit of my grandparents be read and known and I use that so that the authenticity of my life above the Arctic Circle would be felt by people all around the world because you could feel the, the heart of my grandparents speaking through me Yes. And like you said earlier, I find it hard 
to take credit sometimes of what I write because uh, it is how my grandparents taught me. And, and a lot of times I would, uh, when people say it's, it's real good, I would, I would say, thank you, Grandma, thank you, Grandpa. Yes. You know, because because it it is them that taught me in the Inupiaq way how to remember and how to put down on paper the lifestyle that we enjoy above the Arctic Circle. Yes. Do you feel that you're almost an ambassador? Yes, yes. And that it, it is your duty to write and to share these stories? Is that how you feel? Yes, yes. If I didn't, uh, I feel like if I don't write it down, then people will be misinformed. Okay. So what I write down, it informs people of yeah. our lifestyle above the Arctic Circle and why we do stuff the way we do, completely different than Western computer style knowledge we do things for a reason mm -hmm. it's, as a young boy until I was six we traveled every spring and summer out with a boat we lived up in Notak mm -hmm. Notak is like maybe about 60 miles up the river maybe 50 miles but when you look toward the ocean from Notak, it's just like 12, 12 miles away. Mm -hmm. It's just that the river is a long way from the mouth to the to the village. Mm -hmm. But we traveled every spring down that river out to the ocean to get ocean animals. What types of animals would you be fishing for? Seals. Yes. Any, any kind of seals and walrus and beluga whale, bowhead whale, polar bears. We we go out in the ocean and hunt those. There are a lot of different kinds of seals, mm -hmm. ring seals, spotted seals, and bearded seals. You know, there are different kinds of seals, but mm -hmm. we hunt those so that when we go back up to <coughs> no tech, there will be oil for our meats. We yes. use oil from the seal, walrus, and whale, like the French dip. That oil adds nutrients. Okay. That that may be wanting in, in some of the meats, like the rabbit. Mm -hmm. So uh, we learned that from our grandparents. We still do that today. We still go out in the ocean and hunt these ocean-going animals, and we still use their oils today because when you use other oils, you're in danger of getting a, yeah. like a blood clot in your brain because oh. of the, like, like bacon, Mm -hmm. Like if it's 50 below outside and you have bacon in your system, that it could congeal and cause a stroke. Oh. That's that's in the extreme cold. Oh yes, yes. So so we have oils like the like the seal, the whale and the walrus. Those oils when you render the blubber and fat, you make oil. You put that in the freezer. Mm -hmm. You can take that out a couple of weeks later, and you, as soon as you take it out of the freezer, you could put a spoon in it and stir it. It does not freeze and congeal like bacon. So those kind of oils are very important, and so that is just one aspect of our surviving fifty below. The the oils that we put in our bodies are designed not to freeze. It's like an antifreeze, different than than bacon, which mm -hmm. would actually congeal, even though at room temperature, after after a while you could see lumps oh, yeah. on the bacon. You know, yeah, when it turns it colors. Yeah, it turns so, that uh, grayish sort of color. So, so 
sometimes like like way up in Bear when somebody has a heart attack they the neighbor will say he probably ate a lot of bacon this morning oh yeah <laughs> so, and so, that's what's happened yeah so so it's 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 little things like that that become big in our life above the arctic circle oh i see so we use clothes that would help fight the cold like the like some of the fur on the animals like the caribou and the polar bear their fur is hollow the fur have air inside that separates the cold air outside with your body heat so mm-hmm. those kind of clothes were very important for our survival yes now so, were they heavy were they heavy to wear no they were so light they were the lightest clothes that you ever tried it's just just like when my mother made clothes for my father my pair of tennis shoes were just as heavy as all of his clothes he had a hat a parky uh, pants mukluks all those they even his mittens all those were the same weight as my nike tennis shoes that and weighted, so yeah. mainly for 50 below weather outside the hollow furs preferred unless you could get a thick fur with down mm-hmm. then that also could stop the cold from penetrating mm-hmm. the, the only way that i could uh, could go back up north is to have that oil from the ocean and warm clothes so that was taught to me by my grandparents even in this day and age it's still very important to have the right clothes dry socks and the right food in your stomach to help fight the cold all that oil from the fish walrus and whale is like carrying your own little heater in your stomach it oh. produces heat oh, okay and so there are times when i touch my wife after i eat some of that native foods and she say oh you're so warm yes so the eskimo bodies is designed to combat the cold mm-hmm. but also just to make your their self ready you have to be in the right shape yes that's right so if you if you grow up above the arctic circle and just do things every day day in and day out you you just naturally get in shape because the the weather is cold <laughs> the 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 terrain is rough and so if you have the right right diet everything becomes easier so all that comes from the grandparents that knowledge and the wisdom on how to survive is all taught was all taught by my grandparents through stories some stories would last two weeks just telling every night like two or two and a half three hours a night and that one story could last as much as two weeks yes i, I read i read that I could, i could sit there and i could listen to someone tell that story and it'll be the same as my grandparents told it like 60 years ago 65 years ago mm-hmm. so it's because those elders told the story in such a way that you cannot help but remember they had a awesome way of telling stories where it seemed like everything meshed together like gears Yes. Where one part of the story would miss real good with the middle part of the story mm-hmm. and then the ending would miss right in and the plot would be just the same in the beginning as in the ending but 
you would understand more of the plot at the ending of the story as in, than the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that is the Eskimo way of remembering. It is such a pleasant way, and it's so so smooth and easy that I do not think about it. It's just like going to grade school and learning your ABCs. Mm -hmm. You learn ABC. Pretty soon you, you could spell cat, then dog. Yeah. And then after a while, you're able to write a whole sentence, then a paragraph, then mm -hmm. a page, then a book. But... It's the way the grandparents taught me to remember that I'm able to put and down on paper everything in detail about our lifestyle above the Arctic Circle. Yes, because they were teaching the greatest storytellers. I mean, they were teaching the generations how to live and where to find uh, the meat, where to find the fish and how to prepare it as well and it just and it was a it was a teaching that went down through the ages and it was easy to remember because nobody was you didn't have to go in and write an exam or anything on it it was they made it uh that it was enjoyable to learn and enjoyable to listen to them is that right yes mm -hmm. yeah the, they, weren't, they weren't handing out papers and, and, and pencils after each session <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to see what you and, retained. And, and the other awesome thing is we weren't graded. Exactly. The elders didn't grade us. They just told a story yes. in such a way that we couldn't help but remember. Well, it inspires a person to learn because they know that one day uh, that they would be the ones who are going fishing. And I'm sure that there are certain ages where you were allowed to go on hunts. Is that true? Around, allowed to go on overnight or maybe even week-long expeditions. Yes. As I lived up in upstate New York, uh -huh. we were there for five years. There were some of the questions were, how do you catch this animal? Mm -hmm. Or like, or like a bowhead whale. A yeah. bowhead whale could grow to 60 feet long. Yes. At an average of uh, one ton per foot. Mm -hmm. A 60 foot long whale could be 120,000 pounds. So how... And you had to have special knowledge on yes. how to hunt and process an animal that huge. So the Eskimos taught a lot on how to hunt certain animals. Mm -hmm. And what was handed down from their grandparents was the same information that they handed down to us. Yes. And it's just there were so few people nowadays that speak the Eskimo language that those stories are are being lost because oh, okay. they couldn't understand and when yeah. and the people who didn't understand they our language a lot of it is lost in translation it's lost in translation so, yes. so my my stories my short stories to me are very important mm -hmm. because they are a window to my grandparents' world. Right. And I give the grandparents all the credit. Mm -hmm. Because without them, there wouldn't be no reason for me to write. And I would write probably on different subjects. But mm -hmm. as, as in fact, I learned the old way how to do a lot of things. Yes. And when I see some of the people that come up, like the tourists or other people, and they have completely different ways of doing things, mm -hmm. and their their ways would work where they come from, at uh, where where their home is, but above the Arctic Circle, it's it's completely different. They, yeah, it doesn't. That, 
they normally do down there, who, like let's say someone from Florida. People from Florida get cold easy. Oh, yes. There, we went down to Florida and a person says, 20, 23 above is cold. Yes. And I say, well, you come to Alaska and you feel that 50 <laughs> yeah. below and then you get a 20, 20, 30 mile an hour wind. Yes. And that 50 below chill factor will get down to 80 below. Yikes. So, so you know, they have completely different different aspect of what cold is. Oh, yes. Oh, to yes. 23 below to Eskimo is just like a warm spring day. It's warm spring day, yes. <laughs> so, you know, when I lived up in uh, upstate New York, that's how it was. It would get like minus minus 20 at night time. Yes. And then warm back up to minus 8 in the daytime. So I would tell them the coldest part of winter in upstate New York is just like a warm spring day above the Arctic Circle where I grew up in. Yeah. So the, yeah. the things that they do at home would be good where it, where it doesn't get 50 below anymore. And the stuff, if I went there and live with them and then come back up and try to do stuff their way, I, I might lose my feet by frostbite or something like that. Oh, because yes. their, their knowledge is for warmer climates. Yes, that's right. So that's why I write I write the stories like I do in Fifty Below, Surviving Fifty Below, yes. and Arctic Memories. And Arctic because Memories. Those tell stories of how to hunt. Some some stories will be like a, a adopted boy going out with his father, who call him, he call him Daddy now. And you know, we call him Papa, going out in the ocean and learning how to get sails from Papa without using a gun. Mm. So to me, that was very important because if, if I didn't have a gun, I would still be able to go out and get a seal to yes. eat and feed my family. So those stories I write down, even though they might be more modern, they still have the same... Alaska animals, the same Alaskan weather, the same Alaskan territory. I mean, the like mountains and oceans, mm -hmm. same terrain, but different people. Oh, yes. Lots, lots of people that come up are educated, and their education is a completely different than what I learned from my grandparents. I try to teach them as much as I could because I don't want any people that go up north to have any misconceptions and either lose their life or their limbs. Mm. Like frostbite is very serious. Oh, yes. Yeah, people people I know and grew up with above the Arctic Circle live without, without feet mm. because of frostbite. And so, if I could teach people how not to get frostbite, then my job is done because yes. I, they 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 will have their limbs and they'll survive. That is yes. the teaching of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the Rhonda Grant Show right now, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Symatrex, and today. I am speaking with Wendell Stalker, who was raised in the Arctic Circle. Um, can you let people know how they may purchase your book and how they may reach out to you, Wendell? Yes. Uh, my books are on sale at uh, Writers Republic, Amazon, and Barnes & Noble. And my website is Amishimak, A M I. S I M A K. Hamishamak at yahoo.com. 
Wonderful. Okay. And we'll put that in the show notes. What I like to ask my guests at this time, Wendell, is do you feel that you've been called to your journey? Oh, yes. Yes. I I feel that this calling is strong. Yes. It's so strong that I will actually get disoriented and headache when I look at my TV, like yes. a severe culture shock. Yes. But when I read back on my stories, I would say, thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Grandpa. Because I would be reading their words. Even though it's from my pencil, it's their words. Their their way of thinking, their way of putting the world in their perspective. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. What extraordinary discovery have you found in your life? Well, I found that though I might I might move around all over the world. Yes. The Arctic will still be there. Mm. And there will still be people that come up to the Arctic but if they could read my book and understand a little bit of our world, then my calling would be known by the people who read it. And that's very important. It sure the calling is. Of, of teaching my grandparents in ways of doing things above the Arctic Circle. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wendell, for being on the show and And telling us about what you've learned and your process and why you're writing what you're writing is to continue uh, to pass down those morsels, those teachings uh, that you would sit around with your um, grandparents and great grandparents as they would tell you those stories. As you said, they would they would the story would go on for two weeks And I think that you're doing such a wonderful exercise in leaving behind or leaving us with a legacy of the Eskimo people and how they survived and how they took care of themselves. I mean, the tip about eating bacon when it's really cold out, I mean, who would have thought that? But we don't know the consistency of other oil. So I would like to thank you so much for being on the show. Well, you're very welcome. And I would thank you very much for having me on. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day. Theme song for the Rhonda Grant show is Sun on the Water, composed and performed by my friend John Park Wheeler. This is Rhonda Grant with the Rhonda Grant show, author of Magical Forces Within, Extraordinary Discoveries in an Ordinary Life, inviting you to look for the magical forces within yourself today and every day. Thanks for tuning in to the Rhonda Grant show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you would like to find out more information about Rhonda and her upcoming guests and the work that she does, go to her website, rondagrantauthor.com. That's rondagrantauthor.com. Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax.